Hello, beautiful people, and welcome to this next installment of Coffee Chats. Um, I have the absolute privilege of being here with the incredible Zara Miller. Thank you so much for joining us today. No, um, thank you, Kara. Yeah, and in honor of May being Mental Health Awareness Month, um, we have the absolute, again, pleasure, privilege to be talking to one of the authors in the Mediate Press community who knows a thing or two about mental health and uses that to frame discussions of comfort inside of her day-to-day -day work and in the messaging inside of her books. So without further ado, I'm so excited to introduce our panelist, Jen Mar. <laughs> Hi, Zara. Hi, Kyra. Hello, hello, hello. How are you doing, Jen? I'm good. I'm good. How are you both? I'm fantastic. That much better for when I see you. You look very good. Why, thank you, as do you both. Oh, thank you. So I guess, is there anything that you would like our audience to know about you before we officially launch into our discussion? Yes. Oh, well, absolutely. I just want to say hi. And this is to an author community. So I know you guys are all feeling what I have, which is sometimes a lot of ups and downs and good days and bad days. And so getting through this journey is just getting through it. And it is a roller coaster. And on the bad days, no, it'll be great someday. And on the great days, know that there's probably another bad day coming. But it all evens out to a fabulous fabulous ride. And um, my little corner of the world is comfort. That's what we're gonna be talking about. What is comfort though? Um, comfort, C-O-M, means community, fort is strength. You might think of it as that very cozy, alienating noun, which is very fuzzy and comfortable and cozy. Um, but the word itself, I think, was actually started to be a resilient verb, to be strong and have strength, getting people through their challenges. So it really is at the intersection of human care, at the intersection of connection, really brings in a lot of putting emotions into action. Like, what do you do with empathy? What do you do when you feel compassion? Um, there's a gap. Sometimes people feel good emotions, but don't know how to put them in action. Um, and we're trying to solve for this big disconnection we're dealing with, loneliness epidemic, um, where people can feel people see, they can see people struggling and they feel empathy for them, but they don't quite know what to do. So as a result, a very, very high percentage, four out of five people we've worked with have said they don't feel seen in their struggles. So that's what we're tackling. Oh my goodness. Well, that's heavy, but also comforting <laughs> to hear. <laughs> I really appreciate you providing that context for us. And actually, yeah. What Zara just said actually like really leans into a question we have coming up for you relatively soon. But to kick things off, I guess my first question, well, our first question for you would be, how did doing research for your books shape your understanding of mental health and comfort at large? <laughs> well, you know, it kind of, in my journey, it was flipped, right? Because I was on the ground and I was dealing in the aftermath of two terrible tragedies, both of Sandy Hook Elementary, that shooting, and then the um, Boston Marathon bombing. Um, in one of them, I was actually involved in it. I was a half mile from the finish line at the Boston um, when the bombs went off. Um, but in Sandy Hook, I was providing support. And so basically I was seeing with my own eyes, this gap I was telling you about, I was standing in this gap with people that are struggling and people that care, but don't know how to support. And so I saw the need and began to research it. And obviously having been deeply involved with those two tragedies, um, it really did take a hit on my own mental health and made me really look deep into how did I get through that? And, you know, we talk a lot about the need for professional care and counseling. And absolutely, there were people I talked to. Um, we talk a lot about self-care, how we need to regulate our emotions and to practice our breathing and understand internally. And that's also critical. But really, truly, what helped me through what I went through was the support of my friends and family. And um, and, and just having those people that cared for me, that checked in on me, that took me out for coffee or a glass of wine, or we went for a walk. And 
um, just kind of shared the journey with me. Um, because, uh, you know, it's that middle section where we need each other that really is where our true resilience is found. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really appreciated how earlier you were talking about comfort really being anchored in community and how, like, I guess, comfort or support being um, compartmentalized into very, into very small spaces as opposed to it being a web could actually like exacerbate matter like matters of isolation it's like yeah experiencing comfort in and of itself is good but only experiencing in particular places can be just as isolating at times and just feeling isolated in general so i think that you mm -hmm. drawing that distinction is really helpful in us understanding that i would yeah i would agree um uh, what is really interesting to me and that kudos hats off and kudos to you jen is how uh, openly you talk about it because mental health it's one of those quote-unquote taboo touchy subjects for people you know mm -hmm. you know like top three for sure like number one would be money probably and then somewhere <laughs> number two number three would be mental health um so I, personally i wanted to ask you how do you create safe spaces for um your author community um without saying without without actually without shying away from those topics and making them feel like, you know, this is not what should be talked about because you have to sort of overcome that barrier with people at first, I suppose, you know, that they're being mm. shy a little bit. Oh, absolutely. Because, you know, when you don't connect with someone by being, you know, forceful or tell me this and it, right really you have to build this level of trust and so i think what i've learned and what we teach and what i've written about is the fact that it all kind of starts with the right mindset first of all like we have to truly care for someone right so we have to um, whenever we're coming into conversations with each other or wanting to share or talk to somebody um, it's really removing the noise right sometimes we're so distracted and dealing with stuff in our own lives and that kind of puts an overlay over, you know, really understanding someone and getting into these issues. And I do think there's a good trend going on out there in that mental health is becoming a lot more normalized. And so what we really talk about in the latest book I wrote, Showing Up, um, is really kind of overall normalizing the language, right? Normalizing that really truly, if you know, mental health, like anything, is just an area of our lives that we need support in. Um, yeah. You know, if you broke an ankle, you would need to go and, and get it taped or casted or wrapped. Um, and it's no different here. And, and sometimes you need varying levels of professional support um, and seeing, you know, doctors with that. Um, but in the mental health arena, a lot of it is underlying the need for human care amongst your own um, circle mm -hmm. of friends. And, you know, you have you need self-care for sure. And sometimes you need professional care, but in the middle of that are, are your group of friends. And if we can create a safe space where we're not requiring people to share things they don't want to share, but certainly over time, showing people that they can trust you and that you are there and you care if they ever want to share. Um, and what happens then is a lot of little checks in, check ins. <laughs> you know, how's today going? I see, you know, I um, just want you to know, or sending a funny song or dropping off something for them. Like it's just um, care is so many little things that build trust. And then trust opens the door for conversation. Conversation then builds the connection, and connection will ultimately deepen the relationship. So it's a lot of different steps. So creating that space starts with the mindset um, and then builds lots of little actions in to create that trust. Right. Um, I'm thinking, are there, have you personally encountered any cases that you thought was, you know, these people are just beyond help because they refuse help? Like, how do you deal with that when you encounter someone who doesn't want your help, but you are, it just, it, you wouldn't let go because you are a caring person and you know that they need help. Do you continue pushing or how do you deal with that? Well, ultimately all you can do is let them know that you see them and you care, 
right? Mm-hmm. You can't, someone that needs care, you can't push it on them. It has to be something they want. Right. And um, what I think, you know, and you also don't want to be the advice giver, right? We talk about the um, barriers for caring for someone and trying to be a fixer is one of those barriers, right? Like you should just do what I do or do this or do that. And that is the quickest way to close the door on a caring right. relationship. And so sometimes it really is just leaving that space, but not letting that person go and just saying, mm. you know what, I'm going to check in with you in another week and then doing that. Right. Um, and it's almost like sometimes people need to build that trust up because it's surprising to me how few people have a lot of deep connections. And so all it takes is one person to consistently show care and it can be life changing. Um, and that's why this skill is um, so relevant to to what we're dealing with right now. Right. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so another quick follow-up question I have even on that point would be, so I know that you've been steeped in this work of comfort for a long time and your experience with being on the ground with comfort um, enabled you to sort of capture your work with or aspects of your work in the two books that you have created. So I guess, have you experienced a, a, like a correspondence with a reader where you felt that they were able to understand or be, feel empowered to do what you currently do every day through your book? And how does- Oh my gosh, yeah, all the time, mm-hmm. all the time, because it's, um. That's why I do it. <laughs> you know, you have to like always see some measure of success to continue to drive you to do it, right? And and that is the beauty of learning how to do this is that it doesn't take a lot. It's a lot of just little shifts in mindsets and behaviors. And it's knowing, oh, I don't have to fix it. I just need to do little things. Oh, I don't have to do everything in the beginning. If I haven't done anything yet, I can still do it. Um, and so, yeah, I get, I mean, I get phone calls and letters and all the time. And it's, um, it, it just it underscores how critical this is. And it, it usually revolves around someone saying, either I've learned, I've followed this in your book, and it's done a huge, huge change in my life as a result. Um, or it's, holy cow, I, I am using this book with my friends. And we're all looking at this in the book study, because we recognize we're doing this wrong. And, and then we want to study it. Or we have people reaching out saying, can I go through your training? Um, I, I want to understand this more. And uh, that is, that's what starts a community. And that's what you nurture and grow. And that's what leads to more books. <laughs> I think that's a very helpful way of framing it. Sort of to your point, since you do have more than one book, like seeing the momentum of where the conversation is heading and then using that like for the discussion to have that reflected mm-hmm. in the book in actual communal dialogue and then the additional tier of <laughs> and the additional tier of it's kind of like this feedback loop of yes mm-hmm. i put this out in the community for them to discuss and they're discussing it they want more oh this is what they want more of another book and then yeah just continue to build off of each other and hold well, you know Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was just going to say, and hopefully, because your book is so action oriented, it's like will enable the kind of community building because the community won't just build around the book, the community will also build around the actualization of the book's subject matter. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's like a program, like a like a course actualized exactly. the book. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, most definitely. And a community is going to all come together on something. And in the case of this, like when you really think about what this is all about, it's kind of similar to, it's a, it's almost like a lifestyle, right? It might be similar to wanting to eat better or wanting to, you know, get more steps in, um, you know, to close your circles on your Apple Watch. Like it's a lifestyle. It's something you want to improve with. And so basically what happens is you learn that there's so much more to it. It's a constant journey. Um, I've been on this journey 10 years. I learn new things every day Um, because human relationships are messy and everybody deals with pain. Everybody deals with suffering. And we as a human race sometimes are really bad at supporting people that are in pain because it can be really awkward. And so 
anytime people can get together to discuss like, wow, well, like, what do you do when that happens? And oh my gosh, I did that and that didn't feel right. And, um, and so the community kind of comes together like, hey, has anybody dealt with this? Like, you know, just so many people dealing with so much right now. It's crazy. And everybody looking for support and so few people feeling like they're getting it. Right. So within this parameters of support, Zara and I were actually having a conversation about this not too long ago. Um, I guess, do you feel, so you actually touched on this a little bit earlier about how a part of the reason why you were inspired to write this book was because you were navigating your own mental health journey. Yeah. Do you feel that that plays a role like ongoing or was that just what, was that the spark of, of the things that it became a little bit more communally communally focused or do you still feel that your own mental wellness shapes your author journey yeah that's a great question and really what i've learned through all of this is that the more that i'm vulnerable and ask for help and the more that i notice the people around me and what they're going through and remembering it there's this reciprocal relationship that you know, we all recognize we're going to go through hard times. And so you were there for me. I'm going to be there for you. Oh my gosh. Like, what can I do for you? Because you've been touching base with me. Now I want to touch base with you. And it is in studying this more and more and really understanding our wiring, the science of it. And that's how it all comes together, right? This is our bodies are wired for human care and connection. And so the more you do it, um, the more you realize how much better you can do it. And it's just this journey you go on. So for my own mental health, I mean, like face it, these last two, three years have been really tough for everybody. I mean, COVID hit like right, just a few months after my first book was put out, right? right. So everything, like all the book launch was canceled and, you know, my husband's job was eliminated. And so it just, we've all dealt with a lot these last two years. And right. So it, it's always navigating that. Then not only that, writing a book, that's its own mental health journey. <laughs> that's its own hell. <laughs> yeah, right? But no, it's um, definitely, I mean, I think in, it's enlightened me. Um, it's and having the research behind it and the journeys I've been on with just so many people um, that it just, it fuels me every day. Right. So I guess my fo the follow up question to that would be, do you always open up the discussions? Do you always lead with, listen, I have been through this. I know what you are going through. Um, because, um, you know, I've seen a lot of discussion on the internet about mental health and some of it, it's just literally buzzwords, right? Mm -hmm. um, so how do you not necessarily distance yourself, but let's say differentiate um, between those discussions and the ones that you are leading? Because I can't imagine that people might tell you, yeah, I've heard a lot about this. You are not the first one to tell me. So do you then go on the, not necessarily on the offensive, but like, do you lead with, yeah, but I have been through this and I wanna help you get through this? Well, I think, you know, it's a great question. Um, I think another way to frame it, and. It's one of the things in the book is like, you can never say you know what someone's going through because you just don't. Mm -hmm. No one knows what I'm personally going through right now. And you can have two people go through the exact same thing and react differently to it, right? Mm -hmm. So basically the way we frame it is we know you're all dealing with something. You know, you've seen those memes out there, be kind to everyone because everybody's fighting a battle you don't know about. Right. Um, that's never been more true than today. Um, and so our discussions really revolve around what stops us from showing care? How can we be better at it? How can we be better ourselves at opening up to receive care? Um, and so the discussions aren't so much pointed at a person and what are you going through? The discussions are, how can we be better at showing care? And then what happens is ultimately, um, you know, discussions roll over onto discussions and friendships form. And as I was talking about before, that trust breaks down, you know. Um, that's the thing about caring for someone is you would never um, ask them 
to disclose something they're not ready to disclose. Um, mm -hmm. You create a safe space and, you know, try to say this is a safe space and, and we value you and we see you and we care and, and just let it fall from there. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Kyra, your thoughts? I think this is actually touching on something that um, Zara asked about a little bit earlier on. Like, and maybe I just, my mind just naturally goes to extremes, which might not be the healthiest thing, but you, the, there are people who need help. And then there are people who are at the extremes of needing help, like mm -hmm. life threatening things. Situations, yeah. Mm -hmm. So at that point, like to what extent do you like, cause I, I agree that you should never impose help on mm. someone like ideally you want from them to want it but is there ever like in being mobilized and talking about mental health and like destigmatizing those discussions are there things that the public should just be generally aware of where it's like mm. oh no this has gotten to a point where there has to be some intervention even if it seems to go against the will of the person at the time yeah. or is it more like you just take people at their word like i'm just mm. like do you do you talk people off the ledge? Basically, yeah, is that yeah, your job? I mean, as somebody who has unfortunately like lost people to to suicide, like there's always the question of like how far should we and, go? Like, and yeah. who and who could have seen what and when and yeah. how and yeah. No, it's true, and I think you know. In my book, I talk about a suicide survivor, Kevin Hines. I don't know if you followed his story. He survived jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge. And he basically talks about the importance of just human connection and touching base. And he, his line, he was on this great interview with CBS this morning and basically said, if one person would have shown me an ounce of care, I wouldn't have jumped off that bridge, right? And so I am not a mental health professional. And I have conversations with people all the time that I say, I, you know, you should maybe seek out a therapist and, and talk to them about that, but also make sure you have your group of friends, right? Like at the end of the day, a group of friends or family can support someone going through a difficult time way, way different than a professional therapist. A professional therapist is professional, right? It's like a doctor, but it's meant to be a short-term solution to hopefully um, put you on your road back, which is when you're going to need your own group of friends again to pick you up and be there for you. And so I had a conversation last night with a woman who is in that sandwich generation. Her parents are struggling, her son is struggling, and she herself is struggling. And at the end of the conversation, you know, that's what she said. I'm going to seek out a therapist, but I'm also going to seek out some friends and I'm going to handle my relationship with my son a little different. So it's kind of, I was telling you, it's those three areas, right? I'm in the middle area, right? I'm in the area of making sure people have good friends and good solid relationships and, and connections and breaking that awkward zone um, where people just don't know what to say and do. And right now, you know, the people that we're working with is, is the, the statistics are crazy. Like I said, four out of five people do not feel seen when they struggle. And so if we can just train people to know how to recognize, affirm and acknowledge, like, I see you, I see you. And that can even just be with a text or dropping something off. Sometimes an action is just as good. And that's my book is full of those things, right? And that's, that's the goal is making sure nobody doesn't ever feel unequipped to know what to say and do if they see when someone's struggling because right now too many people are awkward and they don't know what to say and do right i do have a quick follow-up question because i know that your book is more of a work of nonfiction, um mm -hmm. and that your book really out uh, empowers people to like take action steps and sort of being a part of that middle space facilitating relationships but I'm curious as to what your thoughts are about, because in that middle space, there are lots of media portrayals of like what mental health is, what like comfort is supposed to be. Yeah. What, 
And sometimes mental health and at either extreme is like extremely sensationalized. Like the TV show 13 Reasons Why, for example. Yeah. And like increasingly mental health or mental health crises being like a thread in a lot of young adult books that are popular now. And I guess my question for you would be, do you think that in general, that increase of presence, and I guess Zara touched on this as well, like is the increase of discussions about mental health like at large a good thing? Or do you think that some of the ways in which it is approached is too haphazard for anyone? It's like, is it being carefully done? Like particularly mm-hmm. within like story portrayals, because there are stories in your book where they're based off of like real people and how you're helping them. There are a lot of fictionalized Mm -hmm. stories that are being produced for the sake of entertainment. And is that good? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're being romanticized and caricatured a a little bit. Well, it is true. And I honestly, I'm not an expert at that, but I completely agree that those portrayals and the way that mental health is portrayed in some of those programs and, and stories can be more harmful than helpful. Um, But to kind of go back, I think, to the first question about the conversations, I think having conversations on the topic is critical and also making sure the conversations are the right conversations, kind of like what you're saying, right? So when we go in and work with college, as an example, um, we'll do assessments and they will get their assessments back and that's what they discuss, right? Yeah. So all of a sudden it opens up like, hey, I'm like this, how are you? And did you, how did you answer that question? And, and we talk about like, none of it is, I mean, none of these things are right or wrong. It's just how we're wired. Some people react to, some people are more introverted than extroverted. Some people immediately feel like they need to cheer someone up when other people want to just avoid the person. And so when you can talk about how different people react to talking about it, it actually becomes easier to talk about it. And having those discussions really then normalizes it, right? And Mm. my main goal, you know, with this awkward zone, I've talked about this gap, is really to normalizing the language that stops us from showing care. And so Mm -hmm. we've broken it down into you, you're stopped from showing care by either being a doubter, that you don't, you're afraid, you don't know what to say, or a deflector, you don't think it's your place. You know, you maybe you just don't have time. Maybe um, you think it's going to be a burden or you're going to approach it as being a fixer that you're going to want to cheer them up or tell them what to do. Um, or you're going to completely avoid the subject and, and never even bring it up. That and all like four me. of those, <laughs> right? Well, you know what avoider. the thing is? Oh, totally. I'm a total avoider. avoider. See, but okay. So then it, this is where we have these conversations, right? And then all of a sudden you can say, well, if you're an avoider, because everybody's going to be in all those buckets at one point, right? It's not like you're just one. Some, yeah. Sometimes I'm going to be a deflector and sometimes I'm going to be a fixer and sometimes I'm going to doubt and sometimes I'm going to avoid. Um, but if I can, if we can normalize this, right, to the point where you know someone's struggling and you can just say, I'm deflecting. And then, so in our workshops, what we talk about or in the book, it says, if you're deflecting, here are strategies that you can use against it, right? Because mm-hmm. when you're caring for someone, it should never be a big burden. If it's becoming a big burden, you're doing something wrong, right? Because this is human caring relationships. And when you care for someone and they're caring back, it actually should feel really good. So right. a lot of that, if we can normalize that and talk about it more, um, then I think the conversations are easier to happen. And okay. the conversations are much more productive because we're talking about solving it right? right. Um, and instead of making it worse. Right. It's very comforting to hear because my experience personally has been um, that, and like, I don't want, I don't want to blame anybody because obviously I am mostly responsible for what I do in my life. So I wouldn't want to sound like, you know, like I'm some kind of victim, but um, I guess what pushed me into being an avoider was that people didn't really want to hear about what I was going through. You know what I mean? Like, it seemed like they were kind of sick of it. <laughs> so mm. over the time, um, I just started being an avoider to, you know, not force what I'm going through on anybody, not force it on anybody, because I was like, I didn't blame anybody back then. I'm not doing it, doing it right now. I was more like, I understand why they don't want to talk about it because they have their mm. things going on. Does that, does that make sense? I guess there's no question in it. It's just a confession. 
That, no, it's um, true. You know. It's true. And and there's like, we call it the, the whole sphere. One is giving and one is receiving, right? And there needs right. to be a little bit of both. And there needs to be dialogue on both sides as to what is right, what feels right and what feels wrong. And so a lot of times, because these conversations are so awkward, it's very difficult to say, mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah. I, I really need you to care. And if I'm talking about it too much, let me know. But can we just go for coffee or, you know, and I really want to know what's going on in your life. And so instead of because that's a lot of times what happens, because when someone's hurting, um, it's so easy to be hurt back. Right. There's this great line. Um, hurt people, says, hurt people. <laughs> there you go. Ding, oh, ding, really? ding. I didn't oh, even really? know. <laughs> I was just yes. like, yeah, I was just like spitballing. I thought, no, no, <laughs> it, it is. It's, I, it's in my book, actually, in the awkward zone, hurting people hurt people. And so it sometimes if we can give each other just a little more grace and space and, um, and have a few more um, conversations about, you know, look, I never mean to dump my baggage on you. Um, but you know, you have a couple seconds, I just want your opinion on something. And you know, build it back a little bit. And, and that it, it, it happens a lot, Zara. And, um, right, right. and, and that's the thing is like, never give up and never think that um, there's always sometimes even those situations can come back and be something that you find humor in and just say, Oh, my gosh, I handled that so poorly. And now that I know how to handle it better. Um, yeah, it's, right. it's messy. There's no other, you know, pain and suffering is messy. And, and that's why it will give us our deepest relationship for sure, but it will also sometimes, you know, cause really difficult um, severing because people aren't knowing how to handle it properly. Right. So I guess my follow up question would be, do you call people out on that kind of behavior? Because and Kyra can attest to this. I have a certain <laughs> reputation of being overly honest. But even I feel like um, in certain situations, and this is one of those situations, it would not be appropriate to call someone on their behavior when like, to be like, listen, I need you to be there for me and I feel like you're not there for me. Mm -hmm. Well, what, what about um, asking them about your behavior? I mean, sometimes things are really messy and instead of, putting the emphasis on the other person's behavior, you put it on yours mm -hmm. and then it gets you talking. Mm -hmm. um, and oh, so know, like asking of, them. OK, so I got it. it's like asking them. So do you think that I'm there for you when you need me? Like, yeah, that? or okay. something like that. I mean, okay. just kind of, you know, taking a break away from the the real intense conversations and trying to lighten it a little bit and um, building it back. Yeah, it's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and time is of time is really important when things can um, get heated in in really intense moments because you know I've been through a lot of these tragedies and and it, it's tough in the beginning right. because emotions are flying all over the place and and that's yeah. kind of when you have to recognize you know let's just give each other a little grace and let's let's come back to this in two weeks right. and think right. about it. Right. right. I mean, to just quickly like add in because. Admittedly, some of this I'm sure is like it, it, it is inside of your book, but to add in like my own kind of profession in this context, out of all of them, because you, as you said, like everybody's probably all of these at different points in life, but out of all of them, the one that I identified the most with was like the fixer, because yeah. it really like scares me to see people hurting. But then when I try to provide a solution, particularly in dialogue with some of the, my younger relatives in my family, it comes across as me being not intentionally but like condescending sort of like it's like oh mm -hmm. here's kyra trying to like say like this is an obvious fix to the problem or like oh, oh yeah like they're preaching to them you mean yeah like they, they're making it seem like like oh here's kyra trying to say like it doesn't matter what other high school girls think of you like if it were that easy i wouldn't be upset blah blah, blah. you know what i mean like mm -hmm. and i'm just trying right. to like, assuage their concerns but i don't know like I guess within the fixer mind, like con construct, like what happens when the person, like when you're trying to help that the person assumes you're doing them harm or even worse that in the helping it's for your own ego and not for their good. Yeah. You know, there's a couple go-tos in the book. I'll share a couple with you. Um, 
And one is just never, ever be what we call a focus grabber. Um, and that is if someone's telling you about their issue, you don't say, oh my gosh, and let me tell you what I'm going through, right? So it's, if you are talking to someone, never ever grab the attention back to yourself, so that's one. And so what does that look like? So we have what we call the pause filter, right? So before, if you're gonna be dealing you know, with someone that's going through something, just remember the pause filter. And the P stands for be present. It's just turn your phone off, put it away. You know, Can you be fully present with that person in front of you and just remove all your distractions? That's the P. The A, Kyra, is are you giving advice when they didn't ask for it? Right. And advice is one of the quickest care killers out there um, because usually people don't want it unless they ask and always ask her, would you like my opinion on that? And if not, then don't you basically you're just there. I'm still a citizen. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, and the E is unloading. Oh, my gosh. Like you just you know, you, you're going to that. You have no idea what I'm going through. And, blah, blah, blah. and, and again, that's like putting more burden on the person. And then the S is stay with the mood. If you're with someone who's really down, um, stay there. Don't try to cheer them up. Just and and a lot of times, just sit in silence and let them talk and be comfortable with that. Um, mm. So that's the S. And then E, keep the emphasis on them. Um, and so, especially with you know, I'm learning. My generation was very very different than generations after me, and I really truly don't know what it feels like. Um, I can't say that we've ever been through before what we're going through. And so, you know, a lot of times I just want to be curious, like, what do you, like, what's it like? Like, what, what do you need? Well, how could, you know, what, what could I say that would say, feel right to you? You know, kind of like just trying to, to understand um, instead of trying to relate back to how it was when we were there and giving them tips on how, they could maybe get through it. Um, and so the pause filter and the focus grabbing are two really quick ways just to kind of sit back. And ultimately what happens is it takes the pressure off of you. Mm. And, um, you know, you have to learn how to sit with silence yeah. a little more and that can take some time. Um, Cause you know, most people, when they're listening, they want to jump in. Um, but other than that, it really is ultimately um, the best way um, to take the pressure off yourself and really help the other person feel like you care and you're listening. Right. Okay. So it sounds like it really sounds like you have all the one, all the one-on-one -on -one interactions pretty much figured out. So no. <laughs> my <laughs> question, and it's the last question, unless Kyra has a follow-up to this one would be, how do you stay in touch with your broader community? That's a good question. That's what it's all about, right? Um, well, we really want to try to know exactly who's engaged with our work and the book. Um, so we love social media to try to get people commenting on what we do. Uh, we send out weekly emails, um, communicating a lot individually, um, mm -hmm. really getting out and doing events and reaching out to other people, asking people, who do you know that I should know? Um, and now that we're finally reaching this post pandemic world, just getting out and networking and finding like-minded people. Um, I've started a LinkedIn audio, um, which is every other week, my go to weekly, which are really great conversations um, to invite people in. And, um, and that's another way. Um, but definitely the main thing is when someone is um, interested in what we do, we make sure they understand how we value them and care for them. We have a network of trainers and then they bring more people in. And so it really is trying to make sure everybody along the chain feels recognized, feeling like they have a contribution, feeling like if they say something, um, we're gonna listen and making sure that they know that any way they feel is okay. And we're gonna support everybody regardless of their political affiliation, their religion, their skin color, whatever, at that core yeah. of it, if we can just focus on caring for each other, I think we can get to a better place. Right. That's a great send off. <laughs> it is, but I, so I guess ultimately in this vein of like send off, do you have any final words of wisdom for us? 
<laughs> uh, final word of wisdom is if you're passionate about something, just never give up on it, right? Like it's, you know, I'm passionate in this work and, and I've had enough traction in it that I know it's good. And there are days that um, something may not feel right. Um, and then there are days that everything feels great. And to know that that's all part of this journey to know that it's normal to put something out there and then question it and maybe tweak it a little bit. Um, you know, John Maxwell has this great line about, you know, business and it's like a circle. You launch something and you find out what's all wrong with it. <laughs> you go back and you fix it, you tweak it, you relaunch it, you find out what's wrong with it, you tweak it, you do that. And so sometimes like, I think I've been on this journey now many, many years and I must, I must be on my you know, 400th iteration of stuff, right? Like you're constantly tweaking your language and tweaking this and yeah. tweaking your branding and tweaking and, and it's all okay. Um, it's all part of the process and none of it is a sign of failure. And, and that to me is when I understood that and didn't let that get in my way, um, it made a difference um, in, in being able to continue with confidence. Thank you so much, Jen. Thank For you, Jen. I'm so excited. So fun talking. Yeah, it was so it was so wonderful to have you. Yeah. And please know that you're welcome back to coffee chats whenever you'd like to come. Um, oh. And, and um, Maybe. happy mental health awareness month. Yeah. Happy, happy mental day. health awareness month. Absolutely. And thank you for um, the platform. Thank you for what you're doing. Um, appreciate all that um, you guys are doing, and uh, just keep at it. Oh, thank you, Jen. Again. All right. Bye. 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 I just realized that ticker was so on. Well, beautiful people, thank you so much for joining us for this next round of coffee chats. If you guys have any, then believe me, we check the comments. We if do. You have any questions about or suggestions for other topics that you would love to see? Do not hesitate to drop them in the comments below. We will check them and we will integrate them into our broader coffee chat calendar. Um, of course, we highly recommend that you check out Jen Mars books and all of the information for the titles of those books are inside the description below as well. Um, yeah, and then the coffee chat next week will be with Ginny Upple and navigating what publicity and publicity packaging looks like for authors. Yes. Any final words, Zara? <laughs> Well, it's always lovely to co-host with you. Woo, thank you so much so, for joining us. Thank you for having me. Oh my goodness. Well, beautiful people, I hope that you have a wonderful rest of your day, night, evening, morning, wherever you are in the world. And stay tuned for more coffee chats and don't forget to bring your beverage of choice. Bye. <laughs>